The Pat Kenny Show with Aviva Insurance on News Talk. Between 1943 and 1961, the early years of Shannon International Airport, over 200 lives were lost and countless others changed forever in a series of fatal air crashes. Peter McGarry has extensively researched these crashes for his book. It's called Falling Stars, Lost Stories from the Shannon Airport Crashes, and he is with me now. Peter, good morning and welcome. Good morning, Pat. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Now, this is a story mm-hmm. that has not been told. You, you never hear about mm-hmm. these crashes. So what's your fascination with them? It's uh, Yeah, correct. It's it's almost a hidden history. It's there and it's, it's, it's under the surface. Um, in 1979, I was... Uh, preparing for my leaving cert and invariably <laughs> we'd have the pyro radio running in the background and one night uh, studying away uh, there was a, a panel talk about uh, this subject the crashes at, at the airport and one of the people that rang in was a, a, a neighbour of ours Arthur Quinlan who was an Irish Times uh, I remember Arthur yeah a lovely man and um, he started to tell a story about jumping in his Austin A7 and heading out over um, the humpback bridge at Bunratty in search of this, he got a phone call in the middle of the night and um, it turned out to be an Italian crash, Alitalia, in um, uh, February 1960. And uh, he went on to describe uh, a scene out of uh, Dante's Inferno and uh, if this was the... If you were writing the script of a movie, they'd uh, throw it out the window because it's so implausible. So the aircraft takes off on, on uh, runway 05. It's airborne for um, 40 seconds. And uh, the bit that's hard to believe is it actually crash lands on top of a graveyard. Extraordinary. <laughs> Extraordinary. So this excited your interest back in 1979? Yeah, uh, Arthur at the time was talking about um, other um, uh, crashes as well, uh, particularly a Dutch crash in, in 1955 and the final one, uh, the, the, the largest number lost uh, president there was in 1960. So uh, it all came together and I thought that's that's very interesting. So let's talk about uh, these flights and what went wrong. Now, we mm-hmm. are still in the relatively early days oh, yeah. of transatlantic aviation. Mm-hmm. In other words, mm-hmm. uh, aircraft going east-west, mm-hmm. uh, sometimes they'd be obliged to stop in Shannon heading west for a last check and refueling, mm-hmm. and sometimes coming east, last check before leaving the USA, they'd stop in Gander in Newfoundland and then exactly. on, on to Europe. So this is the way it had to be. Now, we, of course, mm-hmm. we have continuous uh, flying. So uh, let's talk about... The Star of Cairo, a TWA aircraft. Yeah, uh, back in uh, 2008, I started researching this one because I had the idea in my head that I was going to write a historical uh, fiction novel and it would be a Cold War theme. And I thought somehow I could shoehorn this story into it. So this is an airplane, uh, uh, Lockheed Constellation, TWA. They were just, had recommenced uh, Atlantic services in, in 1946. The flight originated at Orly Airport in in Paris, okay, and um, and you were saying in your book mm-hmm. uh, and in a, a documentary, uh, I learned about this that they they were like family. Oh, they yeah. would they, the crew would be the same crew going back and forth, mm-hmm. so they would dine together and yeah. and so on exactly. And they head out to Orly and get on board, and they're going to go to Shannon and then on to the United States. So they uh, got on board the uh, aircraft at uh, Orly, and uh, as you can imagine, in those days, anybody flying had very deep pockets. It was yeah. it was a fairly exclusive club back then. A um, few days prior to uh, them taking uh, this flight, uh, there was a maintenance error made at Orly where a technician uh, reversed the line inputs into the altimeter, which gives you your altitude. So they they didn't know it. There was a switch in the cockpit that could take you from the main source to the alternative source. So, so one was uh, in case there was icing on the wings. That exactly. was your backup, yeah. and then you had the primary one. But the cabling was switched inadvertently was switched. by the te- technicians. So, what they thought was coming from one altimeter was actually coming from the other. It was actually a uh, sensor in the uh, nose gear. So they were presenting two slightly different uh, readings. So, okay. So, what then happened? The uh, aircraft uh, uh, came towards Shannon and uh, was uh, lining up to make a landing on. Um, or runway 14, which was in operation at the time. So uh, as they were approaching the the airfield over an island called Inish Macnocton Island, which is a uh, load of small islands in the estuary, they were far lower than they thought they were, and the left wing of the aircraft impacted and uh, literally cartwheeled, uh, went up in yeah. a... They thought they were 500 feet higher, higher than they actually exactly, were. Because yeah, the captain, his name was Tansy, 
uh, he lost a leg in the uh, in the accident and hit a strange story afterwards as well. Um, he all of a sudden couldn't see the lights of the airport. And, uh, back then, believe it or not, the the, the runway lights were were uh, uh, oil cans, uh, braziers burning. Uh, that's the way it was. It was like a World War Two yeah. airfield, very primitive. My goodness. Anyway, there were some survivors. There were some survivors. There was a fantastic uh, stewardess by the name of Vina Ferguson, who, uh, with the uh, purser of the aircraft, a guy called Joseph Logan, literally pulled the survivors out of the flames and uh, within a safe distance uh, while they were waiting for rescue. So an extraordinary lady. I managed to speak to her in 2008. Uh, that was something pretty special. Her son and daughter asked me over to visit her in Rhode Island and I never made the trip. I regret that. Regret Lovely that. lady. That She was wonderful. There was a 19-year-old, a teenage, a teenage uh, mother right. with a four-month-old a baby and she managed, both of those survived miraculously, the baby being hurled forward. But she re- reunited mother and baby she did. at the crash site. She did. Incredible. Incredible. Um, the, she was a war bride um, um, which was uh, she was on her way to to start a new life in 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 the states. Uh, the baby's name was Charles, and I, I actually think Charles at some stage uh, uh, contacted me through my YouTube channel to say the baby in the photograph is That's me. me. <laughs> <laughs> now let's move on to the Empress of the Skies, and again we're talking about a technical matter which led yeah. to disaster. Extraordinary story with the Empress of the Skies. It was uh, April 1946 and this was uh, around the world flight. It started in San Francisco and uh, it was gradually coming, uh, trotting the globe. And uh, the aircraft was ch- changed in, um, I think it was Karachi. And uh, the uh, flight uh, approached, uh, as it was approaching uh, Brussels Airport, there was a, this a fault with the illumination in the cockpit. It was a, a thing called a rheostat. It changes. Yeah, which is basically a dimmer. A dimmer, yeah, exactly. And, um, it was but then, so, it, then it, like any inter- intermittent fault, it can correct itself. It can correct itself. And these are the tricky ones. These are the tricky ones. So the fault was logged when they landed. And uh, the next leg then, the um, it was to the uh, early days of Heathrow Airport. And uh, they, they experienced the same thing coming into, into Heathrow. Uh, the crew changed at Heathrow and the new crew came on board and they advised him, look, this is going on. It's intermittent. It's, it's annoying. But do you want to do this? Because if you want to spare part, it's going to take 48 hours to get it from New York. But so the crew said, let's go. He said, let's go. Uh, his name was uh, Captain Frank uh, Jekyll. Very young crews at the time, yeah. by the way, Pat. Yeah, well, a lot of the wartime pilots uh, uh, became absolutely. airline pilots and they absolutely. were all young men. So they're coming into Shannon and suddenly the cockpit they're and their s- instruments... yes which were lit up, suddenly go dark. The go dark. It was their second landing attempt um, on our runway uh, 23, I believe. It's an old It's an old one. It was no longer in use. Uh, so the lights went out and uh, he ploughed uh, into the ground 2,400 feet short of runway 23. But there is a an extraordinary uh, side story to the Empress of the Skies and that is uh, there was a chap called Mark Worst who was an employee of Lockheed living on the North Circular Road in Limerick, which is where I'm from. His wife was a nurse in St. John's Hospital. His wife had come out in the in the car to pick him up. Yeah. And uh, she was there and she witnessed the this mushroom cloud, this, the fireball, and was sure that her husband was, was gone. So she pleaded with the fire department, to, could, I, could I go out? And uh, so they, they travelled out the one and a half miles to the crash site. And uh, there in the... Um, in, in the silhouette in front of the flames was a figure walking. It was actually Mark. He, the, as the airplane impacted, the, the tail section broke off. He literally fell out of the aircraft. There was 31 on board. He was the only survivor. My goodness. Yeah. My goodness. Um, the Triton then was a KLM a- aircraft mm. and it looks like there was maybe pilot error in the prep for that flight. So. Yeah, yeah. The... Um, Pilot of the Triton was a, a massively experienced uh, pilot by the name of Adrian Verule. So senior was he in the airline, he was referred to as the Commodore of KLM. So this kind of maritime accolade was, was given to him. We think so much happened within that crash uh, that there, uh, there's the bones of a fantastic movie if we could get a studio yeah. to entertain the story. Including crew, 56 mm-hmm. people on board and precisely half them. Exactly, survived. it was 50 
um, so a series of errors. He failed to uh, input the correct barometric information uh, on takeoff. He had a lower power setting and it landed in the, uh, halfway across to Shannon at middle point. Um, the, the tower saw him taken off. There was only one guy in the tower that night and uh, saw it with his binoculars taking off, uh, went down to put his head down to log it into the logbook. Uh, meanwhile, the, the fire department had seen it taking off, thought there was something odd about it because it never appeared from the behind the building. You'd normally see the lights taking sure. off. They didn't see this. And they started going on a hunch and they started making inquiries and there was no VHF radio response. But in those days, uh, uh, failures with radio were very common. So they didn't think too much of it. But there's still this gnawing thing that there might be something going on, on, on here. So they got in touch with the radar station and they said, oh, yeah, we can see him. He's over the Kilkee fan. And it actually turned out to be another KLM plane. So it was a whole series of errors. It was the Sunday of the All-Ireland hurling final, by the way. <laughs> Just extraordinary things. So uh, they had this, uh, this extraordinary situation that the aircraft was in the middle of the river, broken in two, uh, half the passengers drowned or asphyxiated with petrol fumes. And the airport didn't know it. It took uh, a guy called Johan Tiemann, who was the navigator, stripped off his jacket at uh, three o'clock in the morning and he swam all the way across the river and negotiated the mudflats. And the mudflats mm. in, in Shannon are just extraordinary. And then knocked on a door. Knocked on a door. Uh, they saw a guy approaching the fire station uh, like the creature from the Dark Lagoon, <laughs> covering in mud. And uh, that was it. That was the start of the rescue. And unfortunately, the, the, the rescue launch was based in Foyne, so it had to come a distance. Yeah. Uh, um, we mentioned the Alitalia mm. uh, crash earlier. And then the, the final one is President Airlines on the 10th of September, yes. 1961. Yes. Uh, President was a, a devastating uh, uh, crash. It, was a, it, was a, it wasn't a very good airline. There was doing only three aircraft. It was a kind of a bottom feeder. They were doing military uh, contracts as well. Mm -hmm. uh, two charter flights. And there was a uh, beautiful uh, Austrian stewardess by the name of Erika Urban who actually swapped flights. There was a, a physics student coming from um, Europe uh, out of the States. And uh, the a second flight, her uncle was on that flight. It was a group of German agriculturists. She was very fond of this uncle. So she uh, wanted to get on his flight. And, that's the flight that went uh, went down. And um, well, it's, it's an extraordinary untold story, and I'm glad mm -hmm. that you have told it. Uh, the book is called "Falling Stars: Lost Stories from the Shannon Airport uh, Crashes," uh, and it's available where this book. Uh, we're spreading uh, slowly but surely. It's in the Easons in the Parkway in Limerick, and hopefully more more Easton shops will take it. Kenny's in Galway as of this weekend. Shannon Aviation Museum. A big shout out to my my dear friend uh, uh, Jane. Uh, Foyne's Flying Boat Museum, um, pilot.ie, or they can email me directly. I want to say thank you to two people before we finish up, if it's OK. My very dear friend, uh, Vincent Power, who has featured in several documentaries, a wonderful Irish examiner, journalist, and a brilliant researcher by the name of Jerry McMahon. So, Vincent and Jerry, thank you so much for everything you've done for me. I stand well, on your shoulders. It's a fantastic book. Uh, Falling Stars, it's called, uh, by Peter McGarry, available as Peter described. Thank you very much for joining us Thank you, Pat. in Pleasure. studio. The Pat Kenny Show with Aviva Insurance on News Talk.